Welcome to Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church, and thank you for joining us for Central Study Hour. Wherever you are and however you are tuning in, we're so glad you're here. We have a lot of songs to sing this morning, and we're so happy that our first hymn is hymn 426, I Shall See the King. We will be singing endless praises this morning, amen, for the King of Kings. Let's sing the first and second verse of I Shall See the King. will soon come in the clouds of glory. Amen. Uh, this was a request from Sarah Sebastian Perez in Alapa, Mexico, and Alejandra Pinal from Zarno, Chile. Thank you all for that request. Our next song this morning is Hymn 50, Abide With Me, which comes as a request from Pam Wimmer in Elk Grove, California. Thank you, Pam. Let's sing the first, second, and third verse of Hymn 50.
If you have a special request, please visit us at our website at sexcentral.org. Click on the Contact Us link. Be sure to tell us where you're from. Choose any song that is in the hymnal, and we'll be singing them, all of them with you every coming Sabbath. Our last song this morning is from the Holy Scriptures. We're almost through this section uh, with two more songs left. But today it is hymn 277. For your holy book, we thank you. Uh, now we'll sing the first, second, and third verse of hymn 277. Now this song uh, actually just took us through uh, why we should thank the Lord for his holy book. He uh, sent people to translate what he sent us from above that people of all nations can read. We hope to understand the wisdom, knowing his love and tender care that is shown through the Bible for his people everywhere. I hope we can sing this song more often in the future and I hope you enjoyed learning this. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy book, and we also thank you this morning for your holy Sabbath, that we can come together and worship. We ask this morning that you send your Holy Spirit uh, to reign on us as we study. Uh, help us understand how Esther and Mordecai were missionaries and how we can be missionaries as well. Please bless, bless Pastor Mike um, as he brings us your holy word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our lesson this morning will be brought to us by Pastor Mike Thompson, our associate pastor at Sac Central Church. Well, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to Central Study Hour this week. And uh, we're still looking in our theme, Biblical Missionaries. And we have a very good uh, missionary story this morning about Esther. Uh, but first of all, our little um, infomercial, if you like. Um, you can get a free uh, DVD or a CD of today's presentation uh, if you call in at 916-457-6511 uh, or email CSH, that's for Central Study Hour, CSH at sexcentral.org and ask for offer number c 21 Five three two. Can you remember that? C two one five three two, and we'll send you free if you live in the continental United States uh, a free DVD or CD of uh, of the presentation. 
So, we're looking at uh, Esther, and we're in actually lesson number six, Esther and Mordecai. And uh, I want to read the memory text first of all, and we will repeat this also this morning as we continue on here. Uh, a very well-known passage from the book of Esther. Uh, this is from Mordecai, uh, Esther's uh, uncle and stepfather or foster father. Memory text is, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish, and this is it. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. That's the NIV version. So uh, we're going to begin a Sunday section Esther in Persia. Now, Esther chapter 1 gives us a a big picture of a a very powerful monarch, uh, the Persian king Ahasuerus, who was at the pinnacle of his power, ruling a vast empire, the Persian empire. We read in Esther there that it had 127 provinces. And um, territorially, Uh, The Persian Empire had more land than even the previous uh, empire of Babylon. It stretched from as far west and south as uh, Ethiopia and as far east as India. So, a tremendous landmass there. Uh, A lot of people in the 127 provinces speaking different languages and different dialects. But here in Esther chapter 1, we get a view into the Persian White House, if I can can use that analogy. Uh, The palace of Shushan, where the Persian White House was, if you like, the royal palace where it was located. Now, Ahasuerus had been king for three years, and he had determined that it was time for him to bedazzle all the princes and rulers of his vast empire Um, with an extravaganza of pomp and partying and uh, just a a downright proud, egotistic display of his vast wealth and power. Uh, I want to read from um, Esther. We're reading some passages from Esther this morning, some of them fairly lengthy, but uh, it's such a good story, if I can call it a story. I want us to get a refresh on the details here. Esther chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. In the third year of his reign, that is Ahasuerus, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even a hundred and four score days, for 180 days, get everything on display here. But it didn't just stop there. As we go in verse 5, it says, And when these days were expired, the king made a feast, and to all the people that were present in Shushan, the palace, both unto great and small, seven days, in the court of the garden of the king's palace. So here we can picture this great extravaganza here. But as the festivities climaxed on the seventh day, um, King Ahasuerus, and you know, those, those kings in those days, they were despot. They had absolute power. You didn't dare offend them because off with his head, that kind of a thing. Um, but Ahasuerus was dealt a very uh, humiliating uh, blow by his own wife, Queen Vashti. As you read the account there, uh, Ahasuerus was well under the influence of alcohol. And uh, so he decided, to cut the story short here, he, he, he asked and requested that Queen Vashti should come before him, that he might display her as an object of his pleasure before all the governors and rulers of, of his empire. Well, she refused. She said, I'm not coming. I'm not there to be just be put on display. So she had, some, she had some backbone and she had some courage and she had some principle. 
that she would not allow this man, king as he was, to make her look cheap in the eyes of all these men who would be ogling her, if I can speak in those terms. So she wouldn't come. Well, I mean, that was a, a slap in the face to this egotistic despot of a king, Ahasuerus, and she was fortunate, actually, to even get away with her life. But to cut the story short, he decided he must show that he was still the man here, and uh, he would not have any woman, especially the queen, uh, put him down in public. So he had her removed from power, and he sent a proclamation across his empire. And read this in Esther chapter 1, verse 22, and it said this. He said that every man should bear rule in his own house. Isn't that right, men? We should bear rule in our house, right? Not, not, not let our wives... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to start an argument here, so we'll let that go. I'll, I'll move on here. That every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people, many people in the empire, different languages, dialects. So I had it written down to let them know that he was still the man and every other man in the kingdom should not let his wife push him around. He should wear the pants and show who was boss. Um, because of the age we live in, it's not quite that easy for men to behave like that these days. But anyway, I won't go there either. <laughs> and so it was into this setting of the... Uh, of the Persian royal court, that Esther, this young Jewish girl, uh, was suddenly summoned, along with numerous other uh, very beautiful young ladies, as prospective queens. The, the king from this group of young ladies was going to select somebody to replace Vashti, become his wife, and the new queen of Persia. And again, because it was a man's world, she had no choice. She was summoned, and she had to go. And when she got there, of course, if you can try to imagine, she, she grew up just an ordinary young girl in the home of Mordecai, her uncle, just a very simple life. Suddenly now, she's thrust here, taken into custody in the royal court in the house of the women, so from this simple home life, she was taken off to literally another world. But another world, perhaps, that many other young women in the, in the empire would probably have, have uh, coveted, dreamed about, to be able to be taken into the royal household, to live in, to live in luxury and with the uh, prospect of possibly becoming the king's uh, wife wife to the most powerful man that existed in those days. Anyway, here was Esther, and I think the thing, that's, the thing that strikes me most as I ponder Esther's sudden change of circumstances is that neither she nor anybody could have possibly dreamed uh, or imagined the far-reaching purpose that God was going to accomplish through her, through this young woman, to spare his chosen people. No, no idea at all uh, what it was going to result in. Now, the word God is not mentioned anywhere in the book of Esther. You're probably aware of that. God's name is not, men not mentioned once, but it's obviously implied uh, that God is certainly uh, moving things around and here in the book of Esther, we see clearly the working of God's hand mysteriously, uh, fulfilling His purpose in Esther being finally, and she was the one chosen to become the new queen of Persia. And um, I think of others also whom God has used, as we read in the Bible. Uh, God, at times because he has foresight and foreknowledge and he sees things which are going to come down the line and he sees the devil's plans to, to thwart the purposes of God and destroy God's people, because of his foreknowledge, God uh, keeps one step ahead. God is still in control, you know that, don't you? 
Yeah. You know, in the dark ages, uh, the faithful Christians perhaps wondered, is God really in control? I mean, here we are being faithful, and yet so many of us are being burned at the stake. One day God will explain why he allowed certain things to happen. But if good comes to us, let us thank God for that. If what in human terms seems to be bad and catastrophic and we're actually called to be a martyr, let us not murmur and complain. If we've given our lives into the hands of Jesus, we know that God is using us, even if it's to die publicly as a martyr, God is using that to his glory. And ultimately, it will result in others being in the kingdom of heaven. So should we ever have to question God and doubt him? No, we, we should not. Uh, but let's look at another example of uh, what looked like a very dismal state of affairs, and yet God brought tremendous uh, good out of it. Uh, look at uh, Joseph. You know, his daddy's favorite boy. Um, his brothers hated him, threw him in a pit. And next thing you know, here comes some traders heading down to Egypt, and uh, he sold as a slave. And there he is going down to Egypt to become a, a nobody. And he was for a while. He was in Potiphar's house, he did well, but then his wife uh, kind of framed him and he finished up in prison for quite a while, it would seem. So when Joseph sat there in prison, probably thought, there I was, I had it good in my father's house. Then my brothers did that to me. Now I'm down here, I'm in, I'm in prison. Uh, and what can possibly come from this? But what did come from it? From prison, that young man finally became the prime minister of Egypt. So we don't always know what God has in store, even if up front at the beginning it looks like this is a total failure, this is a total catastrophe. Can you think of somebody else? Daniel, about 18, 19 years old, dragged off as a slave to Babylon. Now, he was a faithful young man, faithful to God. And yet, was it fair that he should have to take the punishment uh, of all, all the others who had been unfaithful? Didn't seem fair, did it? So off he goes to Babylon, never dreaming that God would so work in his life that he became a very high-ranking statesman and was a mighty witness to God, not only before the Babylonian kings, but also when the empire was taken over by the Persians, even before the Persian kings, God used Daniel uh, mightily. And we could probably think of other examples as well. I, I want to move on to uh, Monday, which is called Esther in the court of the king. Well, we've already discussed how she was suddenly transported from the home of a, a commoner, uh, that's terrible um, terminology used by British royalty. If you're not from the royal family, you're what's known as a commoner. So uh, I'm a commoner from England. <laughs> so we've discussed how that she came from the home of a commoner to become a resident in the royal court. Now, we can probably be sure that all, all these young, beautiful young women that were gathered together there was uh, a history taken of them, you know, where did you come from, what did you do, so we can share this with the king, and he can not only take a look at your pretty face, but he can understand if you've got brains and breeding and all this kind of stuff. So we can be sure that uh, there was a history taken on Esther as she became a candidate for the queenship, if I can use that terminology. But for reasons not explained uh, in the Bible, um, Esther's uncle, Mordecai, uh, admonished her not to disclose anything regarding a Jewish ethnicity, in spite of the fact that Esther was immediately brought into favor by uh, Haggai, who was the keeper of the house of the women. I wonder what kind of a job that was, keeper of the house of the women. Um, Anyway, uh, let's move on here. I want to read from Esther 2, verse 10. 
sorry, uh, Esther chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. So she's uh, taken here into the house of the women. Verse 8, so it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan, the palace, to the custody of uh, Hegai, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house to the custody of Hegai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her such things for purification with such things as belonged to her, and seven maidens which were meet to be given her. He preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the women of the house of the women. So he obviously uh, was uh, rooting for Esther. And verse 10, Esther had not shown her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. Now, a little later on, Mordecai is more than happy for her to let the king know, hey, tell him you're a Jew. But certainly at this point, he obviously had his reasons. And reading in verse 20 as well, we, we repeat here this, uh, this, this sentiment here of not declosing a Jewish ethnicity. Verse 20, Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. So I said, just, just don't say anything. Maybe he thought it would go against her a possibility of being chosen as the queen, but whatever, he had his reasons. Anyway, as I said before, Esther was ultimately chosen by the king to become his wife and the new queen of Persia. But soon after this, things began to take a, a turn for the worse. When another promotion took place, not, not a female this time, but a man, a man by the name of uh, Haman, the Agagite. Uh, he was placed in a very high position in the king's court. And we're going to look at this as we move on to Tuesday's section, which is called, For Such a Time as This. But let's go to uh, Esther chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and let's uh, have a look here at this uh, Agagite called uh, Haman. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Ham Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. So the king wouldn't do these kind of things just for no reason. He must have been a very um, gifted man, must, uh, Haman. He must have been shown himself very capable. And the king was quick to spot his talents of administration and statesmanship, so... He bumps him up to the top. Verse 2, And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants which were in the king's gate said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Don't you know you're supposed to bow to Haman? Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. So he, um, he wasn't ashamed to witness, right, for his faith. He let them know that I'm a Jew. And he let them know he was a Jew in a pagan land. And that, as you know, can be very risky. But anyway, so um, they told Haman that, by the way, you know, he's a Jew as well. Verse 5, And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. Now, I don't suppose it would have been wrong for Haman, uh, sorry, for Mordecai to have bowed out of respect for the office of uh, Haman. But obviously, he felt it was going to be an act of uh, homage to this man whose ego, I'm sure, was already 
uh, big enough. And so Mordecai could no more bow to Haman than he could to an idol and violate the second commandment, which tells us thou shalt not bow down to any graven image. Anyway, whatever the reason, it didn't go over well with Haman. Having already been informed that Mordecai was a Jew, so now this wicked chancellor, or should I call him high chancellor, Haman, saw an opportunity to get revenge, to, to destroy Mordecai, but go beyond that and also destroy all his kin, all the Jews as well. Uh, I'm reading Esther 3, verses 8 through 11. And Haman said, so Haman goes to King Ahasuerus, and he puts this spin on it here. He doesn't say, you know, Mordecai is not bowing down to me, and I think that's really an insult doesn't say that at all. He's very devious. Verse 8, And Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people of all the provinces of thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all people, neither keep they the king's laws, which wasn't true, wasn't true at all. Therefore, it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them, if it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And he was so eager to see this happen, he was willing to front the money here. He says, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver. That was an awful lot of money. I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. And the king, it says here, and the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee, the people also, to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. Well, a couple of things I want us to notice here. Remember I mentioned that King Ahasuerus said, uh, elevated and promoted Haman because obviously he must have, uh, must have been good at what he did, in fact, in spite of him being proud. Uh, and so uh, he, had a, he put a lot of trust in Haman. So we notice that King Ahasuerus at this point, uh, he trusted Haman and he takes his word when he states, Your Majesty, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, Neither keep they the king's laws, therefore it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. Or in other words, it's not to the king's advantage to let, the pe let these people stay alive, to put it in modern vernacular. Second point, Haman does not disclose, of course, that they are Jews. He's very devious. And neither does the king ask, because he trusts him, right? And you can understand in a sense that... Uh, any monarch in those days, in fact, even any president today, you know, they have protection, right? They have bodyguards. They got the secret service. Even today, any president, any monarch knows they're at risk of being assassinated, and it was no different in these days. In fact, possibly worse. So the fact that uh, his very trusted chancellor comes to him and he says, you know, there's some people, he said, they don't keep your laws. Um, the king is probably thinking, mm -hmm, you know, you know, maybe, maybe there could be a risk to me. And um, Haman's letting him know, yeah, they're, they're, they're not good for you. Um, and so he, he took his word for it, believing that Haman had his best interests at heart. And the king had no idea in all this that what his chancellor was doing was seeking to fulfill a personal and evil vendetta against Mordecai which could even have ramifications upon the queen because she was a Jew, Jewess, and that hadn't been disclosed yet. But now we get to the heart of, of the matter here, why God in His providence arranged for Esther to become queen in the royal court of King Ahasuerus. And I, I, actually, I'd already mentioned this, uh, and I'll say it again. God in His foreknowledge, He can see what's coming. And uh, we can be sure that in his foreknowledge, he, he put Esther on the throne of Persia before this crisis could hit so that 
uh, sort of as an act of providence to save his chosen people, the Jews. And, and Mordecai, uh, you can tell, he saw this was an act of providence. He thought, Esther's the queen? This thing comes up now because Mordecai had heard that, you know, this decree had gone forth and it went forth that all the, all the Jews should be killed. So while he was filled with distress and mourning like the rest of the Jews, he was quick to see this providence of God in having placed his niece, his foster child, um, Esther, on the, uh, on the throne of Persia. So uh, Mordecai got straight to it, and he sent an urgent message to Esther. I'm going to read from chapter 4 verse 8, the latter part of the verse, and uh, it's, he wrote, uh, to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make requests before him for her people. So he's letting her know now, tell him you're a Jew and go in and make requests and make a plea for your, your, for your people. Well, Mordecai's directive to Esther was not, uh, not rejected by her, but it still elicited a somewhat kind of fearful response from her. And she, said, she sent word back to Mordecai reminding him what could happen to her if she went uninvited into the king's presence. There's this very strict protocol at the court. I'm going to read uh, chapter 4, verse 11. Um, uh, verse 10, I'm going to begin at verse 10. Um, no, verse, yeah, verse 10. And again, Esther spoke under Hatach and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. She said, take this message to Mordecai, my uncle. And the message was such, verse 11, all the king's servants and all the people of the king's provinces do know that Whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king, unto the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his that is to put him to death, except such to whom the king should hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king for these thirty days. And these words were told unto Mordecai. So he says, you know... Um, this is kind of risky. I mean, you just walk in there and what's more, the king hasn't summoned me for 30 days. Well, Mordecai was very quick to respond, and here's where we get back to our memory verse. I'm reading chapter 4, verses 13 and 14 of uh, chapter 4. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape the, the, in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arrive to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And then we have his immortalized statement here. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? For such a time as this. You know, we can look back in history, even secular history, and we can see that God put certain leaders in place for such a time as that. But um, Mordecai said, who knows, for such an hour as this, you have come to the kingdom. Well, it was hard for Esther to dismiss her uncle's perceptive and very profound statement. So let's read her response in chapter 4, verses 15 through 17. Then Esther bade them return Mordecai's answer. She got the messenger boy. She said, go tell him this. Verse 16, she says, Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. But she was resolved here. She was resigned. She said, if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther 
had commanded him. Um, we can look back, and I want to draw an application here. We can look back in life, and uh, we may be able to clearly see how God has uh, led us to a certain place in our journey of, in our Christian journey and in our journey of service, in God's service. And we may be left in no uncertain doubt that God, God has led me here. I just know that for a fact. And yet, at the same time, in our feeble human frailty, in spite of that, we may still tremble as God calls us to go forward and do that which we know He's called us to do. And we may tremble especially when the path He, he directs us down may be strewn with obstacles which seem very intimidating and uh, scary and um, discouraging. And above and beyond that, I know God has led me here, and He wants me to go down this path, and I see all these obstacles, but I see no visible evidence that I can get around them or that I will meet with success. Have you ever been there? <laughs> well, I know some of us have, and those of us who will remain faithful, we, we will come to that point as we near the end. But at such times, we must trust in God and go forward in faith, as Esther decided to do. Believing that as we do, as we trust God, He will open the way for us to successfully accomplish what He has called us to do. Do you believe that? He will. I want to read a statement here from uh, Patriarchs and Prophets chapter called the Exodus in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets. And let me read you this. Um, <clears throat> speaking about crossing the Red Sea, it seemed that there was no way they could escape from the Egyptians. Had God led them to the edge of the sea? Absolutely, and no doubt. But then He says, I want you to go across. And that's when, oh, we see no means of doing this. But God opened the way, and it says here, the great lesson He had taught is for all time. Often the Christian life is beset by dangers, and duty seems hard to perform. The imagination, oh, the imagination, right? <laughs> oh, that old imagination. The imagination pictures impending ruin before and bondage or death behind. Yet the voice of God speaks clearly, go forward. We should obey this command even though our eyes cannot penetrate the darkness and we feel the cold waves around our feet. The obstacles that hinder our progress will never disappear before a halting, doubting spirit. Those who defer obedience till every shadow of uncertainty disappears and there remains no risk of failure or defeat will never obey at all. Unbelief whispers, let us wait till the obstructions are removed and we can see our way clearly. But faith courageously urges in advance, hoping all things, believing all things. I've read that before. It's a it's a powerful statement. Remember that. So, uh, I want to go on to Wednesday. Mordecai and Haman, we've got 11 minutes left. Uh, we may get through this. I'm pretty sure we won't get to Thursday, so I'm just telling you all up front here. Uh, Wednesday, Mordecai and Haman. And then there's a question asked in the lesson. According to Esther, chapters 5 through 8, how was Esther able to save her people? Okay. Well, deciding to do what she had been bidden and resign to the possibility of death should uh, he not extend to her the golden scepter, Esther courageously breaks rigid court protocol and dares to go in uninvited before the king. So... Uh, you just walk straight in there to where he is. I'm going to chapter 5, 
verses 2, 3, 4, and 5. So there's the king on his throne. Uh, let's just hope he's in a good mood that day, not in a bad mood. You know, he had a lot resting on his shoulders. He had a big empire to take care of. And Anyway, it so happens he was in a good mood, or should we say God had already prepared his mind. I prefer to look at it that way. Verse 2. And it was so when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then the king said unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be given thee to the half of the kingdom. That, that was a figure of speech, by the way. If you found favor with the king, he says, What do you want up to half the kingdom? You shouldn't ever ask for it, right? <laughs> you wouldn't get it. But it was, uh, it was a, uh, a graceful uh, way of uh, welcoming people. Uh, verse 4, And Esther answered, If it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, Cause Haman to make haste, that he may do as Esther hath said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. Okay, so they go there. Now, during this banquet, uh, King Ahasuerus, he's obviously wondering, well, you know, uh, wh what do you want? What's, what's behind this, Esther? So he asked her, he said, uh, what, what is it that you desire? And uh, she doesn't tell him straight away. In return, she requests that he and Haman will come back for a, a second banquet uh, the, the next day. And then, in her own heart, they don't know this, but it's then that she proposes to expose Haman's plot to destroy her people. Now, put yourself in Haman's shoes at this time. He's not dreaming what's coming the next day. And he sits there along with the king and the queen, feeling very pleased, very favored, very honored, very proud. He's arrived at the pinnacle of elitism, having entered the exclusive inner circle of social intimacy with the king and the queen of Persia. Here's the king and the queen, and here's Haman. How oh, his heart must have just swelled, mustn't it? It didn't get any better than that. And how he must have thought, I must surely be the envy of every other governor and, and ruler in this whole empire, the king, the queen, and me. <laughs> well, um, and yet in spite of all that, after the banquet was over, his ecstatic joy was uh, quickly turned to anger as he, conf as he makes contact with Mordecai again. He's passing by. Everybody's bowing, and here's Mordecai. Does he bow? Not on your life. Still refuses to pay homage to, Mod to uh, Haman. So after this beautiful experience of, of joy, and he goes home and tells his family, oh, he said, I was there with the king and the queen, and you know, I just feel so good. And th but then he says, but that, that Mordecai. And he vents his frustration and his anger to, uh, to his family about this disrespectful Jew. And so, chapter 5, verse 14, his wife and his friends have some counsel for him. Then said Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends unto him, let a gallows be made of 50 cubits high. That's like 50, 75 feet. That's pretty uh, grandiose. Let, let a gallows be made of, 50, of 75 feet. And speak unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the king and the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. So as a rich man, and he had uh, called for the gallows company, and they obviously did a quick job, 75 feet. He didn't want to do this in a vacuum. He wanted it to be seen. Now, 
I don't have time to go into this, but nonetheless, if you follow the story of what happens next, um, Mordec uh, Haman meets with a terrible um, humiliation because uh, the next day, the man that he wants to hang, uh, Haman is appointed by the king to go before Mordecai, uh, and God allowed this in His divine presence, the king had Mordecai extolled and had him put on his horse with his crown and his robes because it had been brought to the king's attention the previous night because he couldn't sleep. And that was the Holy Spirit or an angel keeping him awake. He read the records and found out, was reminded that, that Mordecai had foiled an attempted assassination plot upon the king's life. And so he thought, was anything done to thank him? No, your majesty. So he, uh, well, I guess I'm telling the story. So he goes to Haman and he says, well, what should be done to the man who the king wishes to honor? And what did Haman think? Oh, he's talking about me, <laughs> you know. He says, well, let him be clothed in your royal robes, your majesty, and the crown on his head, and let him go on the royal steed, and let, it, let him be ridden through the streets, saying, behold, this is what the king, this is what happens to the man whom the king chooses to honor. So... Haman must have just about dropped when the king said, well, I want you to do that to Mordecai. And so, <laughs> the next day, the next day, there's Haman. He hates the guts of this guy and the horse behind him, but it's his job. See what the king does to him whom he chooses to honor. And when he was done, he was just sick to his stomach. So, he goes home with his head bowed, and he just tells his family just how terrible this is. And, of course, imagine now, how can he go to the second banquet that same day now and say to the king, I've built a 75-foot gallows, and I want you to give me permission to stretch the neck of Mordecai. He knew it was a lost cause, and his family told him, you can't do this now. So... Uh, <laughs> So we move on to chapter 7, where not so joyous Haman goes with the king a second time to Esther's banquet. And so King Hazarias asks Esther again what, um, what it is that she desires of him. So chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. And so now she spills the beans. Then Esther the queen answered and said, if I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold, I and my people, to be, to be destroyed and be slain and to perish. But if we have been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Then King Ahasuerus answered and said unto Queen Esther, Who is he, and where is he that dares presume in his heart to do so? So he's saying, well, who is this enemy? Well, Haman's sitting right there, and he knows it's him. And now for sure, he's scared to death. To his horror and dismay, he waits terrified to listen to what Esther is going to say, and she wastes no time in his response. Verse 6, And she said, and Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. She points to him. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. And the king, as it dawns on him, he's just so upset. He strides out the room. He goes into the garden just livid with anger. Probably realized that Haman had got one over on him. And then he comes in again. In, the, in between time, Haman, seeing that it's a lost cause, is pleading with Esther to please, please speak favorably. Please spare my life. And the king comes in, and he gets totally wrong idea of what's going on, but Esther's on the bed, and, and uh, Haman spr sprawled across the bed, and the king thinks, what, he dares now to try and take advantage of my wife? So that was it. He off with him, and the gallows that he had built to hang Mordecai on, Haman was hung on it, probably within the same hour. Uh, I can't go any further, we've got a minute left, but the story, I think, speaks for itself, does it not? Um, 
Satan has many devices, many plans, many far-reaching, deeply laid plots and schemes to destroy the people of God. He's always had them and sought to work them out. And he's met, met with success to a certain extent, but God ultimately has drawn a line in the sand and said, thus far and no further. And this is what we see here, because King Ahasuerus allowed the, the law couldn't be changed. The law of the Medes and the Persians, it couldn't be changed. But he allowed another law, law to be written saying that the Jews could defend themselves. And they did. And the many people, they, they just didn't even touch the Jews. But quite a few thousand were, were slain by the Jews. They had a right to protect themselves. But ultimately, at the end, we know that the devil is going to try and destroy all of God's people. There will be a death decree. And for all intents and purposes, it looks like the devil is going to succeed. But will he? No, he won't. And the uh, story of uh, Esther and the deliverance of Mordecai and his people and that wicked Haman is just a little picture of the wonderful deliverance that God will wrought for his people at the very end when it looks about time that they're just going to lose their life. Jesus will return, and there will be deliverance and rejoicing. So I have to cut it short and leave it right there because our time has gone. So in conclusion, again, for those of you uh, looking in, I want to welcome you, better late than never, welcome to Central Study Hour. Call 916-457-6511 or contact uh, csh at sexcentral.org. We will send you a free offer of today's presentation. The offer number is number C21532. So God bless and God be with you. And we will see you next week.